Okay, hello. Welcome back. So you guys are all back from your break. I hope uh, well rested. <clears throat> I'm actually recording this before the break. Um, in fact, you guys are writing your LEQs today for, um, for the Civil War and Reconstruction. But we're on to the next topic. Um, we are starting chapter 16. <clears throat> You're still wrapping up chapter 15 Cornell notes this week. But we've finished the Civil War and we are steadily moving west. Notice that this theme, Manifest Destiny, it goes under different monikers, different names, but it's territorial expansion and it's doing it because it's believed that the United States is this special society, government, population that is on the one hand, um, mostly white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and its ethnicity. There's a lot of racism baked into this, feeling that this is the master race and you know uh, these people are fit to kind of dominate the continent. But also there's a, an element of uh, pro-democracy in it, that the US is the most free democratic society in the world, despite all of its faults. Um, in the 19th century, in the late 19th century especially, it seemed like the U.S., especially after the death of slavery, was indeed this liberal progressive society that European liberals very much fawned over, did in the late 18th and early 19th century and continued on, especially after the death of slavery. It seemed, oh, the U.S. finally slayed that demon, got rid of this old relic, and is ready to move on forward. Um, and so, that's certainly um, one way to, to sort of look at this uh, process. Um, the Civil War itself, one could say, is probably best viewed not as a political struggle, but an economic struggle. That you had these two competing economic systems, a slave labor system and a free labor system. And it's very, I hate to say funny, strange, odd, you might say. Um, how certain events people can kind of contest, you know, well, this, that, and our, we're better and you're better, and let's argue about who has the best society or, you know, whatever it may be, football team. There's certain moments where people see the results and then the truth comes out, right? Usually wars are like this, right? Which society is better? And there's no denying it anymore when your side lost. At the end of the Civil War, no one in the South says, well, you know, slavery was the better system, we just lost. If it was the better system, you would have won. It was a very backward system, not highly adaptable. Um, it never solved basic problems that, uh, that it had, like how on earth do we transform our cotton into finished products? How do we set up a national bank so that we can more effectively fund the war? Remember that the South just effectively could never really tax and spend during the war, so it just printed out a bunch of worthless paper money. They had a 9,000% inflation rate during the Civil War, which is just astronomical. It's just unbelievable, um, which shows you that they can't, basically can't perform the normal functions that a society needs to provide for its, uh, for its citizens. Um, so... In this ultimate contest, slavery has proven to be the inferior system. Capitalism was highly dynamic, malleable, uh, adaptable, and highly productive, incredibly highly productive. And although it wasn't an easy task to do, uh, the North and capitalism wins out. And so one could look at the 1850s as sort of this debate, which system is more dynamic and better? And they argue and they argue and they argue politically. We have an ultimate contest, a violent war, and capitalism proves itself to be the dominant system. Had slavery been better, it would have won, and it didn't. And then a good way to view what happens in the next decade or so uh, is that the North wins the struggle and that it implants its economic system on the West very violently, but it does indeed do that. Um, let me share my screen here so that you guys can see. So, there you go. So that's essentially one way to look at it, like an economic perspective. You know, take the politics out and the morality play of which is better and all of that kind of stuff. It's really an economic struggle between two systems which 
capitalism is one and now it wants to implant that system onto the west because this is the united states of america we have vast economic resources west of the mississippi river lay the rocky mountains the great plains so there's wonderful uh capitalist business opportunities to expropriate a country that didn't have a property system and peoples that didn't have a property system. The Native Americans, some 300,000 that lived west of the Mississippi River, did not have said property system. Uh, and it would be relatively easy to take two thirds of a continent from them, expropriate that land, and then sort of sell it off to very rich business interests to, uh, to exploit basically. And that's what we have here. Now, um, under capitalism, there's certain things that investors and capitalists hate, and that is uncertainty. Um, you don't see a lot of investment in unstable societies where there's civil war, or massive conflict, there might be a revolution next week, and you say, well, I don't want to invest my money there. What happens if the currency collapses or if the government seizes everyone's property? Capitalists like stable societies where you have predictable laws, labor laws, tax laws, etc. And this is the very definition of a lawless uh, society. Uh, and I don't mean lawless as in uncivilized or anything like that. That's the theme of most Westerns is the white man's coming West and he's going to tame and civilize this land. And it's a, you know, this godless kind of landscape. In fact, I think there's a Netflix series called Godless. I haven't watched it yet, but it's like a mini series about 1880s, you know, way out West. And, and this theme emerges almost a manifest destiny theme of we have to go West and bring the telegraph line. And now after 1876, the telephone line, factories, banking, et cetera, so that we can exploit this land and make a lot of money. It's what the gold rush is largely about too. Again, the problem is capitalists look out West and they see very dangerous landscapes and they say, I don't want to invest out there as long as it's dangerous. So this is where the Native American wars or at the time what they called the Indian wars essentially stems out of this, of investors telling the federal government you need to make it safe out west. You need to pacify that land. Pacification is one of these euphemisms that we use a lot of times to make really horrible things sound not quite so bad, right? Like a lot of societies have this phenomenon called ethnic cleansing, and it doesn't really even sound that bad when you actually look at the words, but when you reflect on what it is, ethnic cleansing means the, the forced uh, deportation of certain people of an ethnic uh, composition from a geographic area, like literally rounding up all peoples of a certain ethnicity or race and shipping them out of an area. A very violent action, even though you don't intend to or result in the death of those people, that's still a violent process of just forcibly removing people from land, from their homes and, and evicting them. Pacification, similar thing. To pacify means to make peaceful. It doesn't even sound that bad. You give a baby a pacifier so they're more peaceful. But what this really means is the domination, the military domination of the various tribes that live west of the Mississippi. Now, I want you to note something really quick. Um, although pretty much most of US history from 1607 to about 1890 uh, can be viewed as the constant westward movement and domination of the Native American peoples by white Europeans and then their descendants. Um, but it will accelerate, meaning if you look at <clears throat> the colonial period, it took 150 years pretty much to pacify or gain control of the land from the Atlantic up to about the Appalachians, only about a hundred mile wide strip of land and that took 150 years and it was a violent process, but it took quite some time because there's no Europeans and there's a handful and slowly European population is growing with migration and, and birth rates. After the revolution, it takes from about the 1770s until about the 1830s to quote pacify or dominate the land from the Appalachians up to the Mississippi. Remember that um, that's largely what the Indian Removal Act is and the in the 1830s is the continuation and culmination of that process. Uh, and then there's a bit of a pause for a while because we couldn't decide what to do with the West, right? The, the conflicts over slavery were slowing down 
the colonization process of the West because we were arguing amongst ourselves as Americans, is it slave or is it free out West? And um, until you decide that, you're not gonna have huge numbers of settlers move out West. So there's a bit of a, a, a repose here, a bit of a rest, not for very long, just a couple of decades. As soon as really not even the war being over, as soon as the war starts and the Democrats, large portion of them leave, the Republican Party bans slavery in the West. They grant the Homestead Act, which is giving 160 acres of land to any white man who moves to the West. And this accelerated this process right in the middle of the Civil War, 1864, November, right here, one of the most violent massacres in American history ever occurred, uh, where basically conflict between the Lakota or Sioux Nation and miners and railway workers in Colorado culminated where these volunteers, 700 of them, went out to uh, a Lakota camp and murdered hundreds uh, of not Sioux warriors, but just Sioux citizens, uh, women, children, old men mainly, and massacred their bodies and took trophies and did all kinds of awful stuff. So this process will accelerate starting in the middle of the Civil War and understand that the land from the Mississippi to the Pacific is the largest section of the country and the largest section of this phase of the so-called Indian Wars, where two-thirds of the continent is dominated and pacified in about 30 years. So this is the process we remember when we say Indian pacification or the Indian Wars. You could go back to 1607 and talk about the Powhatan Nation in Virginia or uh, the Naranga and Sets or the Pequot in Massachusetts, but usually what's fixed in our brains is the Western films where it's largely the 1870s and 1880s. You watch the HBO series Deadwood, that's largely what it's about. It's this industrial revolution era where it's accelerated and it's at its most violent and it's most grotesque and where we have the most records for what happened because now there's photography and very good uh, record keeping. So here's how this process would play itself out. It's very similar to what happened in Ohio in the 1790s. Or oh, remember Little Turtle when George Washington sends in Mad Anthony Wayne to take care of that situation. Or the War of 1812, where William Henry Harrison is sent in uh, to Indiana to deal with Tecumseh and, uh, and the prophet, his half-brother. This process is very similar too. Valuable resources are discovered. Some mining company sends out some team of uh, fact finders to kind of explore the uh, the Rocky Mountains, do a little bit of you know simple mining. They discover some valuable material, gold, silver, copper, whatever it may be. Word spreads about this, people start to stake claims and it gets very confusing because if you watch, for instance, the show Deadwood, great TV show from HBO from the early 2000s, the very first episode opens and there's this huge mining town there and they say right off the bat, uh, we are not in the United States. The American flag does not fly here. This is part of the Sioux Nation under uh, the Fort Laramie Treaty of I think 1869. And uh, we're not in the US. This is not part of the US. So any claim that you have to land can't be backed up by any court. You are just defending it from the various uh, Native Americans and tribes that live in that area. And so this created huge confusion. Would investors invest in this? Would they loan money to go out there and start mining? A lot of them would not. And so conflicts start to emerge. Native Americans will defend their lands from these peoples who are taking up resources in that area, making it unsafe for them. The violence occurs. And then the US government says, well, we can't have Native Americans killing white people. We have to go in and, and because they're, they're all US, citizens who have moved to this location, they all had family members in the United States who then appeal to the government. The government sends them the troops. Quite often, tribes could fight off for a few years or even a few decades, but ultimately it could just, the tribes could not match the resources that Uncle Sam had with minimal amount of taxation. And the U.S. Army was not that big after the Civil War. Immediately, the Army demobilizes from all, pretty much a million men in uniform down to under about 15,000 in just a few years. In just five, six years, the US Army's back to what it was before the Civil War, which was tiny. This modern notion um, that uh, I, I've heard a lot of conservatives say this, that you know I believe in uh, a strong military for America. That's a very modern 
notion. It's a post World War II. In fact, really, it's a post Korean War mentality. People forget that we demobilized the army after World War II as well, but very quickly we're going to remobilize during Korea and then never demobilize after that. It used to be the notion that it was un American to have a standing army. And so the US is fighting the so called Indian Wars with the very minimal army of 10 or 15,000 soldiers, um, mainly using hit and run tactics. Um, not the glorious wars of the Civil War where you have, you know, rank and file standing shoulder to shoulder in these great charges, um, but instead running counterinsurgency programs, doing really underhanded stuff, killing off the buffalo because you know that the Lakota nation depends on the buffalo for food and everything, um, poisoning wells so that Native Americans could not drink water on, on long marches. Um, the infection of population through smallpox blankets. I'm sure you've heard of that one before. Uh, taking materials used by people who were infected by this deadly disease and then introducing that almost as a gift. Like, here you go. Uh, we're going to give you all these blankets that are from other people who were sick to deliberately infect the population. These were the methods by and large used. Uh, tribes would then sign new treaties, limiting their access to land, and this would happen over and over and over again, essentially. This is the process. Now, most tribes were not really warlike. Most of them were hunter-gatherers or farmers. Uh, and so they would usually sign the treaties because their attitude was, well, we're a very small tribe. We have you know, 5,000 members, 10,000 members. There's no way we can stand up against the steamroller where there's 40 million Americans. Uh, and so they would usually sign these treaties. We usually remember the tribes that fought back, and actually they were in the minority. Only a few did, and usually these are the, the Plains tribes that were very warlike and, and had a very highly militarized society. The Lakota, the Cheyenne, uh, the Comanche, the Apache, the Arapaho. Uh, these were tribes that the, even the U.S. cavalry did not want to fight, not on a sort of man-to-man, -man, you know, horseman-to-horseman contest with, and in some situations the U.S. Army would fight these battles and lose and get humiliated. One of the um, classic examples of that is Custer's Last Stamp. If you guys don't know the story, essentially you had the Sioux Nation, the Lakota Nation, losing, you know, territories of land in the 1860s, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, what added to this confusion is that the Lakota Nation had a, a political system that, that we just could not understand as Americans. It didn't make sense to us. They had three chiefs. Um, and in sort of descending order from the most uh, accommodationist to the most militant, uh, first you have Red Cloud. Red Cloud was a Lakota chief who was willing to negotiate, um, very diplomatic, who had been to Washington DC and invited there on a diplomatic mission and just was stunned by what he saw and said when he returned uh, to the Dakota territories, he said, you do not understand uh, the white man is in numbers that you just can't even comprehend like the leaves on the trees. That's how many there are. And yes, we're seeing just a few of them out here, uh, but we're seeing kind of the furthest power extent reach of uh, the white man, but there's, they'll just keep sending in reinforcements. So Red Cloud would sign these treaties. Then you had Sitting Bull, who was kind of in the middle where he would fight when he had to, but he would make treaties when he felt that it, it was more prudent or wise to do that. And then you had the most militant of these chiefs. Um, you had Crazy Horse, <clears throat> who was willing to fight over every centimeter of land in uh, the Great Plains Sioux Nation Empire and not willing to give up anything. Now, what caused the confusion is the US government, which of those three chiefs do they wanna deal with? They wanna deal with Red Cloud. So they have a treaty signed by Red Cloud granting them access, you know, the railroad company or mining company to this you know, huge area. And then six months later or a year later, uh, members of the Sioux Nation under Crazy Horse or Sitting Bull would attack railway workers and uh, mining workers in a certain location. And the US government would always say, you can't trust those Indians. They signed these treaties, they renege on them. How dare they? Well, what we really lacked an understanding of was their political system. It really was almost like states within an empire and but almost like shifting geography where they didn't claim a certain geography permanently, but it was the members of that tribe that held that power and they were able to migrate around and move around in that kingdom. Speaking of which, um, the, the Sioux Nation was enormous. 
they had conquered, and this was a small group of, of individuals, probably only about 15,000 members of the Lakota Nation existed in the 1860s and 70s, and they had conquered territory that stretched in the Northwest from Montana uh, all the way south to Colorado, all the way east to uh, North and South Dakota and parts of Nebraska. It was an immense, vast empire, which the US technically claimed, but did not control. And it was very dangerous to traverse through those areas. And so this is part of the picture and this is, this is what creates the conflict. Uh, now, incidentally, um, a lot of modern liberals have sort of romanticized the Lakota and there's good reasons for that. But what's often forgotten about is that they were very violent to their neighbors, that, that they had dominated a huge population here of other tribes uh, like the Blackfeet Nation, um, like uh, the Shawnee and the Pawnee. And these tribes did not like the Sioux, in fact, hated the Sioux and therefore collaborated and worked with the US government. Now, in retrospect, that seemed a bit short-sighted because the US government largely made no distinction between tribes and even tribes that collaborated and worked with the US government, the US government would betray and renege on deals and, and just abolish them after the fact. This was determined le legal under the law. The Supreme Court looked at a couple of these complaints where tribes said, look, you promised us this land and then you came back and changed the deal later on. You can't do that. And the US Supreme Court said, with sovereign nations and other countries, we cannot change the terms. But the US government deemed that the Native Americans were sort of wards of the state. They remember under the Intercourse Act, they were dependent nations. So Congress could just overturn treaties whenever they wanted unilaterally and would do that over and over and over again, hundreds of times to hundreds of tribes, just say, we're altering the deal, we're just changing it. And we gave you this land, yes, but now we found something more valuable on it. So it didn't really matter if you fought back or if you collaborated, you were going to lose, you were gonna be re removed to a reservation. This is the beginning of the reservation system. Um, because it was felt this would be the least violent alternative, right? This is how we're going to avoid conflict is you will be over here on land that we prescribed for you. You can operate within these you know, boundaries uh, and we will have the rest. And these lines will be firmly demarcated. Now, part of the problem with this is that Native Americans are given the most worthless land imaginable because if it was valuable farmland, it would have been given to whites, to basic yeoman farmers. If it were valuable mineral wealth, it would be given to the mining companies. If it was great, cattle ranch land, it would be given to the big beef companies. By definition, these strips of land are pretty much worthless. The land is even how we say non-arable land, meaning that you cannot even grow food on it. Um, so how do these tribes support themselves after they've been defeated and they sign these treaties? Um, well, largely they are supplied with help from the government, basically. Um, and if not, they would starve to death. Um, in any case, uh, in the case of Custer's Last Stand, what happens is uh, sort of a mining expedition that goes out to the Black Hills. After the Treaty of Fort Laramie, there's these rumors like, I think that we didn't quite get all the land that we wanted um, and we need to go back and we need to take more. There's rumors that there's silver in the Black Hills. Custer is sent out by the U.S. government. He was a U.S. cavalry general, a hero in the Civil War. Um, in fact, he had graduated right when the war broke out and the story's rather amusing. He graduated last in his class and was always proud of that at West Point. Um, and so he is sent out to kind of disprove the rumors to say, oh yeah, it's not true. There's no silver there. Instead, he finds huge quantities of silver. He writes this report, it leaks out and people just descend on Deadwood, South Dakota. and just show up and start claiming land and sort of setting up a government and, and a civilization there. Um, Custer then uh, goes out to sort of stop the tribes from, from doing this. They, he goes out to sort of defend these settlements against, um, against strikes from the, the Lakota. And he walks right into a trap. Custer had, I think, just 300 men and he walked into a trap that Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse had set for him. And he and his men are completely wiped out. No survivors, every last one of them killed. And it was humiliating. It, it was the worst military defeat in American history before Pearl Harbor, where everyone assumed that the, you know, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, as it was called, or Greasy Grass, as the Lakota called it, that it would be a, a pushover. We'd be able to win it very easily. 
And when news reports came back that Custer and all his men were massacred, there's huge shouts for revenge of raising larger armies and continuing this struggle. And the U.S. Army took quite some time, took another decade, but eventually, excuse me, can't talk, eventually does win this struggle, gets the Lakota Nation to surrender pretty much all of their land. And the rest is history, so to speak. I've been dealing with the repercussions ever since. That's just one episode of this, uh, this saga. There were hundreds of tribes west of uh, the Mississippi River, and this process has played out against them over and over again. Now, this is the most violent iteration of it. It's, it's the, the one that we remember because initially the Lakota win and U.S. government was humiliated, um, but it happened over and over and over again to, to all kinds of various tribes in the area. Okay, so um, what are we left with afterwards? Well, what we're left is, with is basically by, by 1890, uh, the so-called Indian Wars are done. Every last tribe has signed a treaty. They've been pinned in to various reservations. Um, there's not this sort of huge open territory called Indian country that everybody's afraid to travel through. It's very safe to travel west. Essentially, the west has been pacified. Um, and it's very sad because this is a group of people native to the American landscape who controlled everything from sea to shining sea in 1491. And 400 years later, it had all been taken away violently from them. And that's, that's it. There's pretty much no more conflict after that. Um, a people who probably numbered 10 to 15 million people in 1491 uh, had dwindled down in numbers to about a quarter of a million. Uh, now, something very interesting has happened in the last 20 years. Um, numbers of Native Americans have surged, much higher than birth rates have. Now, the reason for this is that there's a lot of folks who might have been ashamed of identifying as Native American before, you know, one quarter Cherokee or you're you know, half Navajo, and you hide that. You don't say it. In the 1940s and 50s, you would never come out and, and tell that to people. There were Native American players in baseball who pretended to be Italian, who would literally change their names because they knew they could not play because of the discrimination. And in the last 20 years, that discrimination has not entirely gone away, but it's been minimized. Um, and a lot of people are now claiming uh, Native American ancestry when before they had not. So the numbers have shot up in a huge way. Um, the largest tribe in America uh, is the Navajo Nation. There's a quarter of a million members just from that one tribe. Um, and so this trend has been stopped and it's in fact accelerating in the other direction, which perhaps is good, but there's this whole other legacy to deal with now, the, the land issues, right? And um, just last year, or I guess this year in 2020 over the summer, the Supreme Court and a very conservative Supreme Court uh, decided that the entire state of Oklahoma, or at least a huge portion of it, like half or two thirds, still belongs to the Cherokee and was in fact given back. Um, and, and if you sort of follow the news stories right now, this has encouraged many other tribes to say, perhaps we can get our ancestral lands back that were basically illegally taken away after certain treaties were just overturned. Um, and we'll see that play out in the next couple decades. It's very interesting and very exciting, and, and we'll see exactly what's going to happen here. But this is a legacy of us. Please understand that the United States is not a European nation. Um, the legal system, the political system, the cultural system, the language is derived from European peoples, but this is a a motif of American society that Europeans don't get, they don't understand. There's an entire subgenre of American literature and fiction and film called the Western that exemplifies this struggle. Um, and at first, there was very much this uh, attitude, this theme when you watch them that the whites were the good guys, the Indians were terrible people and savages, uh, and this struggle goes on and, you know, people in the 1950s and, and even 60s would watch these old Westerns and cheer for, you know, the, the white soldiers and boo and jeer when Native Americans were on screen, usually again played by Italians or other, you know, people who, who were not Native American. Um, nowadays, it's much more nuanced than that. If you watch Westerns today, it's very unclear. It's muddled, you know, who's the good guys, who's the bad guys. Um, but nonetheless, 
Europeans don't understand it, don't get it. They don't dress up like cowboys. They don't watch these movies. It makes no sense to them. What we have a lot more in common with is Canadians, where this process was very similar. Same continent, just north of us. And Australia and New Zealand. Um, in Australia, they have a native indigenous population called the Aborigine. Uh, Dark-skinned people, uh, geographically isolated, and very similar circumstance when the first whites that come to Australia introduce disease, the population is virtually wiped out, and then the colonization process over several hundred years nearly replaces uh, the indigenous population. Very similar. Um, if you go to Europe, no such stories exist. And so there's societies where they don't understand this. It's not part of their cultural DNA. Look at, especially here in California, we're in the West, uh, how much of this art and how much of this literature exists. Um, to a large extent, Knott's Berry Farm is sort of a Western gold mining theme park, basically. The Claim Jumper is, you know, one of these as well. Uh, we have a lot of these paintings, and if you look at our money, we have, you know, uh, at least we used to have, you know, the buffalo on the nickel. Uh, I remember as a kid, my dad showed me his coin collection, and on the penny, before Lincoln was on the penny, Lincoln was not on the penny until much later, I think 1920s and later. Prior to that, uh, it was a Native American chief, okay? It used to be called Indian head pennies. So the U.S. has a weird almost schizophrenic relationship with this. On the one hand, we've commemorated it and, and have great sorrow and pain for, for what was done to the Native Americans and have tried to you know reverse what had happened to a certain extent. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it's sort of celebrated at the same time. Um, it, it's a sort of this weird relationship that we have with this time period. We sort of love it and we commemorate it, but also there's great you know regrets for how it happened and how it played out basically. Um, I saw an interesting story recently where they were talking about this, that even though the, um, the Navajo Nation is the largest nation uh, of Native Americans uh, anywhere in the world, shockingly few people still can speak the Navajo language. It's like under a few hundred people on earth still speak this language. And that is a shame. It's culturally been almost assimilated and wiped out. You'd be hard pressed to find uh, a member of the Navajo Nation under 40 that can speak their native language. And in the 1880s, the U.S. would have accelerated that process and said, yeah, wipe it out, wipe out their cultural, because the feeling was that Native American culture was inferior and it was holding back these people. And that if you strip them from that culture, you know, have them farm like white people, be Christians like white people, et cetera, speak English like white people, that they would thrive and flourish. And so they would have accelerated that process. Now the US government has big regrets for it. And it in fact is spending millions of dollars every year hiring Navajo actors to dub Disney movies in Navajo so that these can then play uh, on reservations throughout the Southwest and hopefully the language will proliferate. Um, I mean, I, I think of this sometimes because with my child now, he's, he's in a dual immersion English Spanish program and to help him learn Spanish, we're trying to say, all right, if you do want to watch cartoons like Captain Underpants or Scooby-Doo, Netflix has a setting where we can put it in Spanish and you can learn more rapidly. And we do that because we want him to maintain the gains he has in that language. Very similarly, this is happening um, with cartoons and such in the Navajo language and Uncle Sam is footing the bill and even subsidizing this process. So you do see at least some change in this policy. Many people would say they'd like to see a lot more none, you know, more land, you know, given back to Native American tribes. Uh, and there's certainly something to be said for that, but at least there is a change in this policy and an acknowledgement of the guilt and, and the shame and the wrong that was done in the last quarter of the 19th century. Okay, so the Native American wars are, largely done, uh, and now the land is to be exploited. So let's talk about mining really quickly. Um, mining was by far the most dangerous industry to be involved with in um, the 19th century. It, it was just horrible. If you look at these statistics, one out of every 30, it's about 3% became permanently disabled. They lost an arm, a leg, a hand, an eye perhaps. Um, one out of every 80 was killed on the job. Those statistics are appalling. 
They're just absolutely appalling. If you said any job today would result in the death of, what is that, one and a half percent or something like that, uh, one and a quarter percent of the population of that industry, and one out of every uh, 30 would be killed, 3%, you would be appalled that, you know, profession would be called the widow maker and there would be all kinds of uh, cries to do something about it. At the time, most people felt uh, that this was a manly industry and that, you know, real men didn't need a lot of these safety regulations. And there's certainly, of course, was racism baked into this because a huge disproportionate amount of miners were immigrants. Uh, on the West Coast, it was mostly Chinese immigrants. On the East Coast, mo mostly uh, Irish and Italian Catholics who waspy Protestants felt weren't even really white. Uh, and so it's not universally those people. There were always some waspy Protestants that, uh, that would do the mining and intermixed with immigrant workers, but that wasn't the perception. Most people said, well, it's, you know, the Chinese workers who do this stuff in Colorado and uh, horrible things were, were said when mines would collapse or there'd be an accident or there'd be, um, you know, a pocket of gas, methane would be, you know, released and poison 200 workers. You'd read about it in the paper. And honestly, most white people kind of had the reaction, well, you know, they're from China. There's plenty more where that came from, no big loss. And that was almost like a saying in America. In fact, there is a saying. I heard my grandfather say it once and I didn't quite understand it. Uh, my grandfather, who has died now 20 years ago and was uh, 90 years old when he died, he was born in 1909. He had this saying where if something wasn't very likely to happen, he would say, and forgive me, but this is a direct quote from my grandfather, he would say that doesn't have a Chinaman's chance of happening. Um, this is essentially a, an ethnic slur when people use that phrase. We use the term Chinese American today, um, but people used to use the phrase Chinaman. Chinaman lived in Chinatown. Um, and if something wasn't likely, you'd say that doesn't have a Chinaman's chance of happening because Chinese Americans were given the most dangerous jobs in the mining industry. Uh, and in the railroad industry do, too, they did both. Now, um, why would they do these jobs? Essentially, <clears throat> number one, they were poor and desperate and their lives were probably even worse in, in China. They, you know, voluntarily came here, but also they were tricked into signing certain contracts that they couldn't read or understand. And then those contracts were enforced later. The great industrialist Leland Stanford, who we revere and worship today in the state of California, he was a US go or a, a California governor for a few years. Um, he built Stanford University and he basically built the railroads linking California to the rest of uh, the country. Um, where did he find workers who were willing to blow apart mountains and lay all this track? He had industrial agents go to China and set up these booths and recruit people and sign these contracts. They would come to California and then they would realize this is very, very dangerous. Uh, the jobs that were particularly dangerous, like get in this little wicker basket and we're going to like, you know, lower you down hundreds of feet and you're going to stick a piece of dynamite into the cracks there, light it, and then give us the thumbs up and we'll pull you up to safety. That's your job. And some Native, or not Native Americans, some Chinese uh, workers would say, forget it, I'm not gonna do that, I quit. And then Leland Stanford would then get the federal agents out and say, you signed a contract, you cannot quit. Now, <laughs> is this slavery? Not technically, but it is a forced labor system where the workers voluntarily agree to do something, but they're sort of tricked and then they're forced after the fact to finish the job. If you ran away, uh, the federal court system would have agents track you down and send you back and say, you have to finish this job. You're not a slave, but we're gonna make you finish. So this is a rather disgusting process, but this is what was done. Um, Chinese workers, along with several other immigrant groups and some native born people, uh, built the railroads of this great nation and deserve a huge amount of credit because it was incredibly dangerous. Mining towns were weird, weird, weird places, otherworldly, almost like colonies from the 1600s. Uh, the gender ratios were all mixed up. These were areas where the jobs, men did these mining jobs, women did not. Now, occasionally you would have women work in the mines, like if you had a, a really tight enclosed uh, shaft where a, a 
typical male body would not fit, you get a woman to do it. Uh, children would be higher too. They had no child labor laws back then either. And so if, if you had a particularly narrow mine shaft, you'd get like a collar and strap it around somebody's neck and tie it to the mine cart. And you would literally crawl through the mine shaft like that. Some women do, did do those kind of jobs. But mostly um, women were pretty much absent from these towns. They would um, work in the saloons, um, usually as prostitutes, uh, hired and, and uh, brought out there by pimps, basically. Some of them would be wives and daughters of the saloon keepers, sort of, you know, I'm associated with the business owner in some capacity, but the gender ratios were usually 10 to one right? Like 10 men for every one woman. So as you might imagine, feminists write today about to toxic masculinity. Um, whatever you think about uh, these theories, it does seem pretty true that when you exclude women from a certain area, bad things start to happen. <laughs> men just behave pretty badly when there's no women. Women, I think, kind of act as a moderate, moderating influence on men. They're, they usually tell us when we're doing stupid stuff like, hey, that's dangerous, dumb, dumb, don't do that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, you're right. I probably shouldn't do that kind of stuff. I shouldn't get in a fist fight over this guy over, over some ridiculous card game or something. So you had a lot of violence. Uh, you had a lot of bad behavior. You had a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, you also had a system which was very non, and in fact, I would say anti-democratic. Um, I've already, you know, explained to you these awful labor contracts that existed where you could not quit your job and the government would force you using violence to go back and finish your job. What's less American than that? Isn't it every American's uh, dream to quit their job? Um, well, you couldn't do that. Second, you'd get to these mining towns and they were quote unquote company towns. It was really terrible, meaning you get there and there is no mayor and there's no city council. Um, there was a very famous I should say infamous uh, mining company known as um, Anaconda Copper. And Anaconda Copper owned the town as they said, lock, stock and barrel. They owned everything. There was no mayor, there was no city council, there was the company. The company is all powerful. They own everything. They spent the money to develop the mine. They also own the general store Okay, it's not like today where you got 18 grocery stores within a five mile radius and you go to Trader Joe's or Walmart or whatever you want. No, you go to the company store. So you give that paycheck right back to the boss and it's a monopoly. So he screws you over. He has these ridiculous prices. In fact, there's a lot of these company towns that don't even pay you in dollars. They pay you in what was known as company script. Today, this would be the equivalent of working for Walmart and getting paid in a Walmart gift card and you can only spend it at Walmart and it's useless anywhere else. So you can't even really quit your job uh, even when your contract's up because you take that company script to another town and it's worthless. It's not US dollars. All of these practices are illegal today. They've been put out of existence by very good labor laws that we have because this is how corporations behave in the absence of any regulation. They just say, well, human beings are just machines to make us money and we're gonna do whatever we can. No safety laws, no regulations. You've probably seen in movies or you go to Knott's Berry Farm to the Calico Mine Ride and the guys have like little canaries and bird cages down there. If you ever wondered why, we have this phrase, you're the canary in the coal mine. The canaries, I think birds in general, are just more sensitive to certain poisons than human beings are. And so that was your, basically your breathing mask of today, right? Where nowadays miners would go down into a mine and have breathing masks so that they don't breathe in the poison gas. Back then they didn't have such things. And so they just had a canary where if the canary keeled over and died, you'd say, all right, out of the hole and everybody would run out because you hit a methane pocket. That was your defense, a canary basically that would warn you. Um, a mine shaft collapses and kills 25 people. You can't sue the boss. They had no laws that allowed you to do that kind of stuff. You lost an arm and you can't work anymore. You don't get workers' compensation. There's no minimum wage, there's no maximum hours. There is nothing to protect the worker. So these are pretty horrible, lawless places. Um, there's a very famous uh, folk song that Tennessee Ernie Ford uh, recorded in the 1920s. Um, and uh, the the lyrics go that you load 16 tons, what do you get another day older and deeper in debt? St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store, right? Meaning 
I cannot even quit this job and move on because all I have is this company script and it's worthless and the company store literally owns my soul. Very depressing song, but this was a depressing fact of life. Interestingly enough, there was a group of white people in the Rocky Mountains who uh, were also sort of targeted by Uncle Sam, not nearly as violently as Native Americans, but the feeling was that the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon church, was uh, bizarre, godless, that they were polygamous, that they were just terrible people, and that they could not be given a state to control. Utah had the population to become a state as early as the 1870s, but the US government just couldn't imagine it. I mean, these were people that practiced polygamy and community property. The church owned everything. They didn't have private ownership. So you had these sort of mining companies in Utah that were much like the rest of the US and their culture and everything. And then you had the Mormon church that was there that was totally different, operating under a different model of existence. And so the Mormons were targeted by several federal laws. This is US territory in the 1870s and 80s. And so you can tell them whatever they wanted. Um, Several U.S. senators, uh, Senator Edmonds in particular, really hated the Mormons and threatened them with seizure of their property uh, and all kinds of other penalties if they did not go mainstream, basically. Finally, the Mormon church relented. They resisted and resisted and resisted. And finally, in 1890, they said, okay, we're going mainstream. The church fathers at that time renounced polygamy. They said, we do not practice this anymore. We will not practice it going forward. We're going to be mainstream and we're not going to do community property anymore. We can force members to pay a tithe to the church, but we're not going to own their homes and property and businesses and everything else. And so this was a huge change in the Mormon church. Many people are still very prejudicial towards the Church of Latter-day Saints. And, you know, I kind of sympathize with the Church of Latter-day Saints here. I remember when Mitt Romney ran for president in, the, in uh, 2012, just eight years ago, and there were all kinds of comments because he is Mormon. Oh, how many wives does he have? And, but, 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 you know, all these, you know, slurs against the Mormon people. And I said, you know, I'm not Mormon, but if I were, I'd be really offended. My church gave that up in 1890, you know, 120 years ago, 130 years ago now, and people are still on and on about it. It's like, you know, enough already, right? The, the church has gone very mainstream. All right, on to the next one. So we have one industry. We have uh, the mines. We talked about that. That was one of the great resources in the West, and that's being exploited at this time. All kinds of metals and materials are being dug out of the mountain ranges, melted down, made into iron and silver and copper and all the rest of it. And a lot of wealth was being made. Amazingly, even more than the mineral wealth, the biggest moneymaker out West was beef. Beef was a huge industry. It still is a pretty big industry, but it was the biggest at that time. Nowadays, we have high technology things that are much more lucrative than beef. But at the time, in the last quarter of the 19th century, beef was not the largest industry in America, but the largest industry west of the Mississippi. So the Spanish introduced the Texas Longhorn into Texas when it was still Tejas um, in the 1700s. Um, in fact, probably earlier than that even. And it had, some of them had sort of broken free and gotten away from Spanish ranchers. And they started to breed just kind of wildly on the Great Plains and competed with the buffalo for certain resources. And honestly, this probably killed off more buffalo than uh, the US Army did trying to you know, force the, the Lakota to surrender. It killed uh, more buffalo than, um, than any other means was just ranching was the encouragement of cattle to eat up all of the free range grass in the Great Plains areas. And then the buffalo just largely starved to death. Just in a matter of about two decades, the 1860s and 1870s, buffalo shrank from several million down to just a few thousand to the point now where seeing, seeing them in the wild is truly extraordinary. I mean, you pay pretty big money to, uh, you know, go on tours of uh, Yellowstone to actually see buffalo in the wild. Or you guys, if you went as freshmen, you might have seen them in Catalina, which I was very disappointed to find out that cattle are not indigenous or uh, uh, buffalo are not indigenous to Catalina, right? That those are like 
brought in. They were brought in to film a movie in the 1950s and they just sort of left them and they're sort of, you know, wildly existing there, but they were brought there very recently. It's not like they've lived on Catalina for centuries or millennia. So beef was a huge industry. Um, now, uh, at first, most of these cattle are controlled by uh, farmers or ranchers in New Mexico. Most of them were Mexican before the Mexican War. Now they live in the U.S. And a lot of underhanded things were done by territorial governments and by the federal government to, again, expropriate that. Much like what was done to Native American land, this was done to uh, Mestizo people, Chicano people in California, in uh, New Mexico, in Texas. Uh, they were bullied, they were threatened, they were sent in crazy bureaucratic circles where they said, well, you know, you have to prove that you own this land. And then they submit the papers and you say, well, you know, this is in another language, we can't read it. And, uh, you know, until you can find an English deed, we're not going to, to grant this. And so much of this underhanded stuff went on, it's estimated about 75, 80% of Chicanos who owned land and were ranchers and had any kind of property uh, were turned into paupers, basically. Instead of owning the ranch, a few decades later, you're working as a ranch hand for some white person who stole that land, essentially, from your father. So this is done all throughout the West. Um, and, uh, and then the industry starts to thrive. Now, basically, the heart of the industry is that America's getting very rich in the 1880s. We, we're now 20, 25 years out from the Civil War. And the economy is booming. Immigrants are pouring into the country, uh, just a steadily growth in, uh, in industry all over the country. And as people get richer, their tastes change. Um, and when you study economics, there's this interesting phenomenon known as inferior products. Um, the, the law of demand essentially says that as people's income goes up, they tend to buy more things. And you guys notice that. Your parents get a raise, they start to buy more stuff. For some goods, that is not true. Like once you make it to a certain level, you don't shop at Payless Shoes anymore. You're like, oh, I don't want to wear that, right? You'd stop shopping at the 99 cent store. Or if you go, you're like, uh, I'm not going to buy Shasta Cola anymore. It's just too embarrassing. Even though it tastes exactly the same as Pepsi and Coke, my friends ridicule me. So I'm going to not buy those things as much. Those are called inferior goods, you know, by and large. Um, and so people stopped buying other types of meat because beef is kind of considered the Cadillac of meat, right? It's like the classiest, fanciest one. You want a nice steak dinner, right? And so as salaries went up, people stopped eating as much, you know, pork and chicken and things like that, uh, or just the lack of meat. People eat eggs and, you know, nuts and things like that. And they said, I want beef. And so Lots of rich American, and in fact, most of the money came from England, from British investors. If you notice, Britain was very rich at this time. Britain controlled all of India and half of Africa at this time, and British people were very rich. And they set up huge beef industries because they had no land to, to cultivate their own cattle. So they invested huge amounts of money in America and Argentina uh, in the beef industry there. If you notice, uh, there's a couple of places where beef is almost like a religion. Texas is one of them. Argentina is another. If you guys know, there's just they're, vegetarians just don't exist in Argentina. They love their beef. It's a very much a meat culture. Uh, they have the gaucho, right? We have the cowboy. Incidentally, uh, you see Santa Barbara. That's their mascot is the gaucho. It's essentially the, the cowboy. Um, so let's talk about the cowboy real quick. You have very hungry mouths in America ready for beef. The problem is that the cattle are far away from those markets where you have to get the cattle to the people. And so you had to transport, physically move hundreds of cattle every month from Texas out on the Great Plains in the panhandle of Texas, a thousand miles north to Chicago or a little closer, Kansas City, where they had big cities and slaughterhouses where you would then sell it to the slaughterhouse owners. They would slaughter it and then they would then sell the beef. Modern refrigeration did not quite exist yet. So beef had a very short shelf life. So you had to get beef to the actual places where people would buy it and eat it in just a few days. It's not like now where we have factory farming where you can set that up almost anywhere. The cattle are slaughtered and then 
the beef can be put on refrigerated trucks and transported anywhere. That didn't exist at the time. So you had to physically drive, not in a car, but like on a cattle drive, like these four cowboys here, would on a horseback try to manipulate and move a herd of usually uh, 300 head of cattle per person. So these four guys could probably uh, move 1,200 cattle on a cattle drive, and you'd move them 1,000 miles up to Chicago. It, this would usually take a month, these cattle drives, and when you got paid, you get paid $30 at the end of it, which you would usually blow in a single night, right? You'd go into the local bars and brothels in Chicago and go spend the night with a woman, drink a lot of whiskey, spend it all, and then ride on back to Texas and do it all over again. This business has been so romanticized in American life. Look at Woody, right? You guys watch Toy Story. The hero of the story is Woody. Although I've watched these movies a lot now that I have a kid, Woody is a huge jerk in the first one. He is not a nice person. He's so mean to Buzz in that movie. Knocks him out the window, right? Um, we love the cowboy. Go to Texas. People are dressed up like cowboys all the time, which is really weird when you think about it because there have been no cowboys since the 1880s. Um, so it is a Halloween costume that people are wearing all the time, right? It's, it's rather bizarre. It'd be like if I dressed up as Julius Caesar or something. It's like all the time, every day, right? That's what people are doing with cowboy boots and 10-gallon hats. It's like there have been no cowboys for a long time. It was a short window of time that this existed. Basically, from the end of the Civil War in the 1860s until uh, 1886, basically, 87 is when it ended. That's it, just 25 years or so. So why has it been so romanticized? Um, largely because in modern American life, uh, we have to have jobs, right? Pretty much. And business owners, I t guess, technically don't, or their business is their job. But most of us work for wages. We have a boss. And this is the conceit of a lot of our art today, songs movies, they're just about the soullessness of drudgery of going into work and not owning anything of your own and having to work for someone else and how boring and micromanaged our lives are, especially now with technology. Every second we're under surveillance, either by the boss or our computers are spying on us or whatever. And the feeling of many modern people is that this was a romantic era when uh, a man could have a job and feel like he was still free that he wasn't in a factory, you know, pulling a lever all day long with the boss, you know, literally up in the rafters watching you all the time. You were out on the plains. You had your ukulele. You had your buddies with you. It was like a long camping trip that never ended. Or rather, it ended, and then it began again anew. Um, you, it also harkens back to uh, what a lot of men feel is sort of a lost era of masculinity that you didn't call 911 if you had a problem. You were out on the range with your herd. What if the Comanche come out of nowhere and threaten you? Uh, there was this sort of cowboy code, almost like medieval knights, where a cowboy did not leave the herd for any reason. You were under the employ of a certain beef company. You did not uh, run no matter what. And so you would go down defending the herd, just the four of you. Um, it's not like today where, you know, I... I have fired a firearm probably three times in my entire life. I'm not an expert on it. If someone broke into my house, I don't own any firearms, I would call 911, right? Uh, which many modern men, they just can't quite get over. They just feel we've been totally emasculated, right? We don't defend our castles and our property anymore, take the law into our own hands. We just delegate that out to somebody else, right? That's the price of civilization. So many people sort of like this. This is, as, as my grandfather used to say, different grandfather on the other side, he would say, this is a time back when men were men and women were glad of it, right? That even women today don't like that men have been emasculated and, and stripped of all kind of sense of, of being able to defend themselves and defend their families. I will not opine and give you my opinion on this, but this is what many people have believed. And this is why the cowboy has been romanticized, right? It was just you and your friends under the stars, independent, strong, and full of honor defending the herd. If a, a, what was much more common than Native American attacks would be a cattle rustler. A cattle rustler was someone who would wait out in the forest and steal a cattle because a cow was probably five, ten dollars a head. It was big money. If you could run off with three or four, that was a lot of money. That might have been a month's wages. And so beef companies had to start tracking these cattle and they would brand them, right? You take a branding iron in, in uh, the fire and then you stick it on the rear end of your cattle and that scar lasts forever. 
It's a very violent process, but it does the job. You know exactly how many cows left Texas and how many arrived in Chicago. Some might be born along the way and you brand them on the trip. And then you can see if you're missing some of them and then if they pop up somewhere else. If you go to a cattle market and a cow has someone else's brand on it, they know that you've stolen it. And so this is why this was done. Now, what eventually killed this era? Um, what killed this era by and large were um, two or three things. Number one, um, fences. That there was huge amounts of public land in between Texas and Chicago and you used to be able to take 1200 cattle and just march them totally abreast, you know, a mile wide and just march them all the way to Chicago. You could not do that anymore by the 1880s because so many homesteaders had moved into Kansas and Nebraska and the Dakotas and made huge farms and your cattle are now trampling their crops. And so a new invention is discovered and this is barbed wire. One of the more American inventions I would say, right? Stay off of my land or I will literally cut you, right? I'm gonna make a fence that's not this gentle little picket fence that cattle can knock down and they would, but barbed wire where if cattle brush up against it, they get scratched, they get you know cut pretty badly and then they avoid that. And so, fences started to creep up and more fences. And then it got to the point where it was just too difficult to navigate through this. You might have to go eight miles in one direction to get around this huge farm that's 10,000 acres or more. Some farms were that big. Wheat was becoming a huge industry too and highly mechanized at the same time. And so fences by and large is what killed the cowboy. There's a very famous country and Western song called Don't Fence Me In. I don't know if you guys have heard it, but this is what it's about, right? The lyrics are, give me land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. I want to ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't fence me in. Hopefully you guys know that song. I'm not going to sing it because I can't sing and it's terrible and this is recorded and I don't want to become a meme. Um, but very famous country and Western song that encapsulates the cowboy and how they felt about fences. Wide open range, free, don't fence me in, right? Second, um, blistering cold winters. Three of the coldest winters on, Ameri in, in, on record in America, in the American West, struck the Midwest between 1885 and 1887. Some of these cattle drives, all you could do, you would get hit by a blizzard midway through. The cowboys would set up tents and you know try to light a fire to keep warm. It might last a week or two, and then you come out and you just count the dead carcasses. Uh, there was nothing you could do. If you continued to march, you would have died yourself. And so at the end of some of these cattle drives, uh, the cowboys might have lost 80, 90% of the herd and no business can sustain those kind of losses. Uh, and finally, um, overgrazing, that so many farmers moved into the Midwest that they brought their own cattle and their own animals and they just totally ate all the wild grass. And so for long stretches, 100 miles or more, there's no grass to graze on and there's no water because so many rivers had been diverted for irrigation for crops that the cattle would either die of thirst or die of hunger on these drives. So effectively this ended the cowboy industry and what they started to do was say, let's move some of the herd up to these cities, to the outskirts, and then we'll breed the cattle there. They won't be free range anymore. Again, one of these things that we pay top dollar for, we will pay huge amounts of money to get free range beef, right? Beef where the cows are not fed corn on a high density feedlot, but instead they can exercise more, get, you know, uh, graze around and the meat, the meat is more tender, it's more lean, it's, you know, better quality, et cetera. It's how beef was meant to be way back in the day before modern factory farming. So that's the cowboy and that's the beef industry. Um, it, it's a very curious thing. Again, we have so romanticized the cowboy. Again, we, you know, he's an icon in America, not outside of the U.S. very much though. I want you to note that, that people don't dress up as cowboys uh, for Halloween in England. It makes no sense to them. They have no hiss. They're totally cut off from it. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, but in America, it's very much this icon where, again, a lot of people in Texas dress up like cowboys every day, which to me is very weird, but, you know, hey, I'm from California. I'm a city slicker. So let's now move on to the homesteaders. In the middle of the Civil War, when the Republicans gained these huge majorities, some two thirds of the House and two thirds of the Senate, they could do whatever they wanted at the federal level. 
And they started saying, what are we going to do with the rest of the Louisiana territory? Still, in 1862, even though Louisiana was purchased in 1803, still it was not largely settled. A few places like St. Louis and New Orleans, but even Kansas, although a state, had very few people there. And so how are we going to populate this region? The Republican Party decided to give 160 acres of land to any white man who moved to the Louisiana Purchase Territory. And you lived on it for a year. And if you, quote, improve the land, like a federal inspector came out and said, OK, you have a dwelling on this land and you're growing something, then you, you get it free of charge. You pay up front, but then you're refunded the money on the back end. This is truly extraordinary. Now, I will say, I mean, this is a process where land is being stolen from the native population who was here first. Um, it's uh, a, a process that's not very nice in that respect. But I want you to reflect on something else. There are waves of revolutions in the 20th century that at their heart are largely about the uneven distribution of land. The Mexican Revolution of 1910 is largely about uh, the fact that 95% of the Mexican population had no land and were peasants. And a tiny amount of families, really, just about 20 families in Mexico owned like 90% of the land. And the rest of it was owned by Rockefeller and American corporations, the oil and the mineral wealth and everything that had been sold off to Yankee businesses, basically. Um, Russia had a revolution in 1917. If you read Bolshevik propaganda, it was peace, land, and bread. Land is the second one in there. Peasants, which was most of the Russian population, had no land. They had very un uneven land distributions. This would be like in America if the Virginia Company claimed the whole continent and made all of the white population into peasants and didn't have any slaves. The US did it very differently. We had slaves, which certainly was not good, but at least the white population did become largely self-sufficient by having small plots of land, 40 acres, 60 acres, 100 acres. Um, by the way, Spain had a, a, a civil war basically uh, over this as well in the 1930s is that again, most people were landless peasants and had nothing to look forward to and wanted land of their own and huge landowners owned most of the country. US did not develop this way. We could have done the same thing where we just said, hey, if you're in the government, we're gonna give you the sweetheart deal where your family gets the whole Louisiana perch. It, that wasn't done. It was carved up into small plots and basically given away to poor farmers. It is shameful it wasn't done to other peoples as well and that the land wasn't violently stolen from Native Americans, but it wasn't just given off to rich politicians. Um, and this changed America forever. This was sort of the safety valve of America where industrialization, if cities were overcrowded, uh, death rates were high, disease was terrible. If you didn't wanna to move to a city, you could always move west and just get land for free. Whenever population got a little too high and land prices would go up, the US government would open up another territory and try to keep prices as low as possible so that cities didn't become overcrowded and violent. And, and you had a situation like industrial England, like if you read Oliver Twist and the orphanages are just overflowing with poor people because there's too many poor industrial workers. US always had the West, which again was our safety valve. So hundreds of thousands of Americans move out West to take advantage of that. Now, um, the dirty little secret about all of this, uh, we've sort of romanticized these people too, is that, you know, a lot of people today will say like, we tamed the West, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was very hard work. And roughly half of the people that move West under the Homestead Act failed to improve the land and move back home. The people that had the highest success rate were immigrants immigrants that could afford land. So this would mean Germans and Scandinavians by and large. A lot of Swedes moved into Minnesota. A lot of Germans moved into Wisconsin. Um, a lot of uh, 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 other people, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants from the rest of the country moved into Kansas and these other places and the Dakotas. And they tried their claim at this. Now, the problem was that the Great Plains were very dry um, and the land had solidified into what was called sod. Um, I didn't quite understand this until I bought my house and uh, I had our gardener basically who tends to our outside property of the, the uh, townhouse area explain to me that after every rain, you're supposed to go out to your backyard and like take some farming implement and break up the soil because what happens is 
the soil gets wet, it dries and it sort of clumps together. And then it rains again and it, and it keeps going through that process. So what you had happening was Native Americans didn't use European farming techniques. They were hunter gatherers by and large, especially on the Great Plains where many of them lived off of Buffalo. Um, and so they had never tended to this land for thousands and thousands of years. It was just sort of wild like that. Yet underneath that sod is the most fertile land on the planet. Because of uh, geological conditions thousands of years ago during the last ice age, a glacier basically cut off the topsoil, like the top 40 feet or so of the whole middle swath of this country revealing the most fertile land anywhere in the world. If you guys don't know, still to this day, 75% of the corn and grain on the planet is grown in about six Midwestern states, Kansas, Iowa, the Dakotas, Nebraska, that, that region right there basically is 75% of the corn and grain in the world. It didn't become that way overnight. It took a lot of people working very hard to do it. So this is a farming that's brand new. It's a farming that is, uh, outside of the possibilities of mom and pop farmers trying to, to make a go of it. First of all, you would have to borrow huge sums of money to even begin. Now the land is free, but you would have to buy farming implements to break up the sod. Very little rain out on the Great Plains. So you would have to uh, dig wells and pump water out or divert rivers to irrigate your land, which was a, a huge process, which means you have to dig crop rows that are dug well. You can't have the water pool in certain areas. It has to go out, you know, you have to have it on a slant and, and do it so that the water trickles down and, and gets to all sections of the farm. You have to have pesticides and herbicides. You have to take care of, you know, weeds that grow there and you have to get rid of the locusts that, that swarm there. Yes, I said locusts. You may not think that they, you know, exist in America, but hey, go to Kansas. They should have that on the license plate. Come for the grain, stay for the locusts. Um, people write about this, that the locusts, if you guys don't know what locusts are, they're basically like big grasshoppers, swarm in huge numbers. They literally can block out the sun. There's so many of them flying and they just descend on crops and they just can eat a whole field in just a few hours. So you have to now treat them with pesticides. This was hard, hard farming. So uh, then you have all the machinery of the tractors and the balers and all that stuff. Now, let's say you don't want to do that. You just say, I'm going to do it all by hand. Well, your neighbors now are 10 times more productive than you. They've produced way more grain. They can sell it at a cheaper price and now you're out of business. They're gonna gobble you up. They're gonna basically say, hey, we're gonna buy you out now and make our farm that was 160 acres. Now we're gonna buy yours and we're gonna be 320 acres. And this is basically what happens is successful farmers who played the game and played it well, um, who incurred that debt, but then gobbled up their neighbors and were able to pay off the debt, they do well. The small mom and pop ones slowly get pushed out of business and they moved back to Indiana or New York or wherever they came from. For the immigrants, it was conquer or die. They were not going back to Germany or Sweden or anywhere else. They were going to try their hand at it and succeed. And most of them do. Um, but the work was just too hard for most native born Americans. And they just said, forget this. This is just no fun. It's incredibly lonely and isolated out on the Great Plains. Um, Another great country and Western song is Home, Home on the Range. I'm sure you guys have heard it, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the skies are not cloudy all day, right? Uh, these were songs sung about the loneliness, just uh, Kansas, my father grew up there and he tells me it's so barren and, and devoid of any kind of geographical landmarks. You can look out and see literally the curvature of the earth. Um, McPherson, Kansas is the geographical midpoint of the US. Like if you drew an X from like Seattle to Miami and from like Maine to Los Angeles, it would intersect right there at McPherson, Kansas. And if you stand in McPherson, Kansas, I have been there and look out, you stand on a chair, you can see all the way across the state. There's just nothing. And it's very bleak and it's, you don't have hardly any neighbors. So this was very, very harsh. Plus the winters are terrible beyond belief. My father tells me, you know, in Kansas, there's about two weeks of good weather in April and about two weeks of good weather uh, in October. And the rest of the year, it's just either 110 degrees with 90% humidity or it's minus 10 degrees. Uh, and that's the high for the day for much of the year. Very barren, very, very difficult. California is very different from this. 
California is not under the Louisiana Purchase. It's exempted from the Homestead Act because the feeling was that that type of farming, like done piecemeal in small plots, was not super productive. Now, grain was being produced all over the planet in Europe. Russia produced a lot. Canada produced a lot. That the feeling was we didn't have to have huge overproduction of grain. In fact, we probably needed to cut back production to boost prices. California was thought very different. It was the one place in the United States where you could grow exotics, uh, citrus, right? So uh, lemons, limes, cherries, strawberries, that, that kind of stuff, acorns, um, avocado, apricots. All of these things thrive in California's Central Valley. I live in Orange County. I've lived here my whole life and I grew up in Garden Grove with four orange trees in my backyard and just thought that was totally normal. Well, when the house I grew up in was built in the 1950s, it was Orange County. It was one big orchard. This is a, a it's a drawing. It's not a, a picture, uh, but it's a drawing of Orange County. So from San Clemente in the south, all the way up to Cypress and La Palma in the north, this is what it was, one big orchard. Because it was felt we needed to boost the production of these crops because they were very rare for American markets to keep prices low so Americans could have a good diet. So you could not move to California Central Valley and get your 160 acres of free land. The richest corporations in the world come in and buy up that land and produce it. And they do it not like homesteaders, you know, mom and pop people working on their own, but they hire largely uh, Latino workers from Mexico to do incredibly hard work. In fact, very little has changed in the last 170 years still. This is largely, I'm sure you guys know, um, you drive through the Central Valley, it's a lot of migrant workers working under unbelievably harsh conditions uh, with very few rights, even to this day. Um, and I think I mentioned this, that agriculture is very different than industry because if you don't plant on your certain day and continue on, you lose the whole crop for the whole year. And so workers don't really have the right to strike or call in sick and do stuff like that, even to this day. Um, so. California, we got wines, we got grapes, we got oranges, we got the little sun-made raisins. Do you guys remember getting those in your lunchbox when you were like five years old in kindergarten? Those were the best. You know raisins have a bad rap now, but I love raisins. Um, California is the only uh, state where you can produce wine. Yes, Oregon claims they can produce it. I've never tried it before and I think it, it's probably not very good, but it's very funny. Um, Again, Europeans very much turn their noses up at American culture, right? Everything we produce, they think is mediocre. Uh, and then to some extent, they're right, right? Like our, our chocolates aren't as good as European chocolates. You know, we talk about cheeses. Our cheese is, you know, not as good as that. We have cheese in a spray can, right? It's ridiculous. Um, just about 30 years ago or so, um, at some of these wine competitions, a lot of California wines beat out the French ones. The French would never like to admit that, but French grapes that have been cultivated for thousands of years, like the Cabernet grape, right? Uh, Pinot, all these grape species have been transplanted to California where they've thrived and where California wineries, it's this thing you do when you're middle class and you live in California, you go to the wineries in Temecula or Napa Valley and you go on one tram and you tour it and you drink the wine. It, it's very much, a, a, Alcohol, like so many things in American life, has this class component to it, right? If you're working class, you drink Budweiser, right? If you get enough money, you start drinking the IPAs, the Indian pale ales, right, that are micro-brewed and they're very fancy, right? And if you get a bit more money, you start to appreciate fine wines and stuff. And California is sort of the mecca of this in, uh, in the United States and really in a lot of places in the world. There's a lot of people from all over the place that come to California to see Napa Valley um, and, and to appreciate that. I've never understood this, you know, like, you know, even when I do want to have the occasional glass of wine, I've never understood. I want to see where the wine comes from. It's like, well, wine is portable. You can move it to a city. I can sit on a street corner. Uh, in New York and have a glass of wine. Why do I want to look at where the grapes come from, right? It just never made sense to me why you would want to do that, but I don't know. Some people do it. As you can tell, Osborne does not like camping. I absolutely hate it. I'm not a big fan of nature and bugs and sunburns and stuff. I like the indoors. It's great. Okay, so moving on to our last slide here, spirituality and ecology. The American West is a unique place on the planet in that it was um, industrialized very late in the scheme of industrialization, meaning that 
by the time that the Western lands started to industrialize, where mining companies and logging companies and, and beef companies came in, that there was now finally the thought of preserving some of this land, right? That um, if you go to Japan, for instance, it industrialized such a long time ago and they deforested so long ago that they have regrets now. They're like, oh, oops, we chopped down like 90% of our forest hundreds of years ago and we never thought about the consequences of that. Same thing in Britain. They deforested, they mined a lot of their mountains ages ago and they never thought to preserve it. So what you have in the US are large national parks, which were preserved in the late 19th century uh, for people to appreciate today. Essentially, the environmentalist movement springs out of the romantic era, right? The transcendentalist movement that we have to preserve some of nature for its spiritual quality, right? Think of Yosemite here in the picture. Now it's in California, I guarantee most of you have been there at some point in your life and it's gorgeous. How would you guys feel tomorrow if Yosemite was sold off to private businesses and they came in and they built a Walmart in the valley and they said, hey, you know, like I think of this sometimes, I would love to go on that hike up to the top of Half Dome, but I'm kind of too old and out of shape and uh, it would, I, I would never be able to finish it and you can't get up there by any other means, you gotta hoof it, right? What if we built an escalator to the top and we built a Starbucks on the top? Wouldn't that be great? Think of the commerce and the jobs. Well, I hope most of you were yelling at your screen right now saying, Osborne, but it's so beautiful. It's our national property and heritage. We have to preserve it the way it was so that future generations can enjoy it. And, if you, and I agree with you. And if you ever do go to Yosemite, what I've noticed every time I go there, and this is for all national parks, Sequoia, the Grand Canyon, all of them, and our state parks too, you know, Joshua Tree, etc. Um, is that I see a lot of foreigners there. I see a lot of tourists from Japan and South Korea and China and, and England and Ger I hear more German and French often at Yosemite than I hear English or Spanish, which are the primary languages of California. Uh, it's almost like we don't appreciate this stuff because it's so close to us. But if you live in other countries, you find out Oh yeah, we destroyed nature a long time ago and never even thought about it. The US, at least we have the thought to preserve parts of it so that future generations can get that spiritual enjoyment. And again, <laughs> I'm not a camper. I camped in Yosemite 10 years ago and, and I love Yosemite, but you know, not showering for like five days was ugh, just awful. Um, you gotta pay $5 and wait in line 45 minutes to take a shower and we never had the time to do that. So I thought that the experience was bad in that aspect. So I like to stay like in a motel outside of the valley and then you drive in, you walk around for two, three hours, you take a picture and you go, great, I got the point. I don't need to live in it for five days. But even I can appreciate the beauty of these natural landscapes, they're great. And now with social distancing, it's one of the few things we can do and not be indoors and, and have fun on vacations, right? It's hard to go to hotels, uh, restaurants, et cetera, but you can still go camping and keep your six feet of distance and you're outdoors. So a lot of people are, renting these, you know, uh, you know, trailers and driving to various uh, national parks or just, just driving there on their own and pitching a tent. It's great stuff. This is something that's kind of unique to the US. Like I said, a lot of these European countries are just very small and they didn't preserve this stuff. So this is, this is great. Um, and again, it becomes our mythology. We love these books about Annie Oakley and Billy the Kid and you know all of these figures from this particular time period. Movies, um, television shows, books about the Old West. It's become this sort of mythologized part of our history. Now modern film and TVs, if you watch Deadwood and stuff, they very much take the shine off of it and show you just how rough it was and, and frankly how awful it was in a lot of ways. Um, but it remains a huge part of American culture. Not as much in Southern California, but if you go to Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, still this Western motif is huge. Think of all of you that have dream catchers in your room. Uh, think of all of you that, uh, you know, you go camping with your family. How many of you, your dads love these old Western movies with John Wayne and Clint Eastwood and they watch them over and over again. Um, this is a, a huge part of our culture and you don't necessarily have to embrace it, but you have to just understand that it exists, it's out there and it's, it's, like so many other things we've made, like jazz and baseball and stuff, it's, uh, it's uniquely American, which is kind of cool. Okay, that is it. Um, 
this week we have a uh, two asynchronous days, the 6th and the 7th, which is Wednesday and Thursday. So you get a bit of a break. This is a lecture you'll do Monday and Tuesday. And then you'll get a bit of a break. We'll pick up on what was all this beef and, and lumber and minerals, what was it fueling in the east? So we'll do the other side of industrialization and look at factories and steel mills and, and industrialization and urbanization and immigration next time. Okay, but I thought we'd look at, the really best way to look at it is the West is sort of the rest of America's colony, right? If you look east of the Mississippi, it's all states that have been established a long time with big cities that need the raw materials. And then the West, everything West of the Mississippi was almost thought of as America's colony, complete with an indigenous population, right? And the British went to India, uh, the US went West to conquer the Native Americans. It's largely a similar process, extracting the wealth from that and shipping it East to be exploited. Okay. All right, guys, I will see you next time. Have a good one. Bye-bye.